the function pointer and I think we have tried some uh, challenges, right? I mean, there were some plans to, did you try it? I think something I shared it to you to try or something. What was that? Yeah, you did, but um, unfortunately. I <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay. No, no worry. Yeah. No worry. Yeah. yeah, it's been a gap. Okay. Yeah. So fine. I mean, you know, let's start some more thing and we okay. will also discuss that as well. Okay. On sure. the group. Now, see, by knowing all the concepts, let's also uh, focus on how these programs can be also executed on the target hardware and architecture. So what are the you know, okay. quick way of uh, verifying and testing our applications on target hardware. Okay. So you have been working on any, uh, recently you are working on some architectures, right? Like, uh, have you been working on like ARM? Or? Um, yeah, it's it's mostly ARM architecture, uh, the Broadcom works. Broadcom works, okay. Yeah, hmm. mostly ARM architecture, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. You know, there is a project out there which uh, we often use it uh, for emulating the entire hardware of the user at this piece. Okay. And this project is uh, referred as QEMU or QEMU, you know, QEMU, okay. QEMU. Uh, uh, refers to quick emulate or emulation. So you know, what it does, it's a nice open source project. Mm -hmm. you know, and um, sorry. Just wanted to let you, because you know, as a uh, hardware side, we definitely want to work on this you know, emulator platform. So entire hardware can be virtualized over here. You know, so the idea is that without you using the target hardware, uh, you can do a lot of application testing much prior before the hardware has arrived to you, you know. Okay. Okay. So at least, you know, the core features and functionalities can be easily tested out there. Oh, okay. So, so you can work. Like multi-core? Uh... Yeah, multi-core possibilities. In the, oh, okay. Usually, you know, like you can configure you can do a DTS programming and all those things. You know, the device tree structure can be given as an input, and the entire kernel can be built by you. And OS can be run. You can build the U-bootloaders and test them. Oh. You know, so, so the, you know, the Android uh, has a emulator called as uh, Goldfish. Okay. Yeah. 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 So this Goldfish is built on top of this QEM. Oh, okay. Okay. So, and you can. See, that's very powerful emulator by you know looking at it you can almost check most of the things right yeah, yeah. so i mean you know uh, it's always good to you know try and see all the applications running on a hardware emulator before you actually try on your target board right yes and emulation means you know most of the program which is running here will run unchanged on the target hardware okay uh, so yeah i mean yeah so uh, how, how do we handle, like if, for example, I mean, if I'm using a Broadcom uh, mm. song, so I, I know the ARM, um, the version that is running. Okay. So that's sufficient to run this or, uh, I mean, how, how, how we can. Uh, yeah, I'm going to, uh, okay. I just wanted to explain that, you know. Okay. Yeah. Probably, you know, if you could have taken an embedded course, embedded Linux, I mean, there we also explain about the entire system build, you know. Okay. So here I'm just going to give you this idea about how cross building can take place and quickly can be tested, you know. Okay. So okay. when you, you know, see installing the QEMU, when you type QEMU and you know you use this tab, right? Yeah. Usually you you get the different kinds of architecture which QEMU can be emulated. So as you can see here. QEMU is for Alpha, ARM, i386, Chris, PowerPC, MIPS, PPC64. You know, so QEMU is supported for various such uh, hardware architecture. Okay. And it comes with uh, two emulation environment. One, you can emulate the entire system called application layer. Okay. And the another one is you can emulate the entire system. So if you look at QEMU ARM mm -hmm. and QEMU system ARM. 
The difference is that QEMU-ARM is good for testing your applications. Okay. Okay. So you can write a C code, cross-build them, and immediately run on QEMU-ARM. Okay. And test it, which we will show you today. Mm -hmm. But however, if you want to build the entire system, say you want to build a bootloader, then you want to build a, a root file system, you want to build a kernel on top, then that needs to be tested on a QEMU system ARM, actually. Okay. So then we need to learn about how do you compile the kernel, cross build the kernel and you know, load the VM Linux in it. How do you build the boot? How do you build a root file system? How do you use a busy box and then you know, bring the entire system up? Okay. Oh, oh, so okay. unfortunately that's not being covered as part of this session. Okay. Okay. But that's how you could, you know. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Now we also need to know how to install the cross two genes. So, you know, one of the easiest ways that you would use something like a sudo and apt get install. And then you can use gcc dash and say arm and tab toys. So if you use the tab toys, it will explain you the different kinds of tool chain which is possible. For example, gcc compiler to be run on arm for Android based binary files. Mm -hmm. It's a compiler. This is an ARM Linux. This is non Linux. You know? mm -hmm. So when you install these tool chains, usually they get stored into a specific directory. Mm -hmm. And what I am doing here is giving a demonstration. I'll be sharing you the link where you can download this tool from here, okay? okay. From a drive. And you can also try this out and come back. Yeah. So you know, inside the tools directory, we have this tool chain installer, something like this here. So if I run this binary, you know, you can see a navigation UI coming up. So I hope now you can see the dialog box. Yes. yes. So this code source 3G++ is a compiler from, you know, mentor graphics. Mm -hmm. So they distribute this, uh, you know, open source uh, for certain architecture they support, usually ARM. This is the ARM cross tool chain. Mm -hmm. As you can see here, G++ Lite for ARM. Mm -hmm. and probably, you know, very easy installation like next, next, next. And uh, you know, I accept and then I browse down, go next, and then next. This so usually it's very you know typical, and then next. And so we don't do much, uh, you know, the location being chose, going next. You want to modify the path, of course, yes, so that you know the path is set, okay. and so and so on. So in my case, you know, I have run these you know commands one by one, mm -hmm. and then it has been installed, okay. Right. Important thing is where you want to install that read write permission should be there. So, you know, by default, it is choosing your home directory. Yes, yeah. Yeah, but in my case, what I've done, I've kept it in you know, opt directory slash opt. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what I wanted to say. So, to be, you know, be able to compile the C code for, you know, these architecture, ARM architecture. First is to get the, you know, compiler being built for us, isn't okay. it? So this will be the step which we can follow. This is one of the graphical way of yeah. you know uh, launching the program. Okay. The another way is, as I said, you can use a sudo apt get kind of stuff also. Something like this, I guess. Sudo apt get install GCC. I think something else is arriving.
and uh, say GCC R. So this is also another technique by which we can you know, try to build, say for example, GCC R non-EABI. Okay. And I give a password and it asks that, okay, in my case, it's saying that it's already a yeah. newest version. In your case, it may ask you for downloading and installing. Okay. And once you select yes, uh, it goes and install the software. Okay. So the moment it is installed, one way to check is type arm and then press tab twice. As you can see, all the, if the path is set, you know? Right. Yes. If the yes. path is set, I'm sure that you're aware that, you know, all yeah, the yeah. commands we, possibility we, are visible yeah, we, to us. And, we, we do have, I mean. Yeah, yeah. Cross yeah. Too, so. yeah built. so, you know, just trying to ensure that, you know, yeah. yeah. And we have the same things on your own box also. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so now let's try to, you know, see if we can build and test one very simple application first. Okay. And then you can you know, uh, yeah. make complex ones also. So we'll take the same source code which we had taken for a native build, if you remember. Very simple C code. Yes. And what we do is we try to build this with, say, ARM non GNU. API GCC. So I'm compiling this and then I wanted to have you know, sample.c and the result's going to be say sample.arm file. Okay. So now the moment you do this and if you say file sample.arm file as you can see it says it's in yeah. Yeah. yeah right. So now naturally if I want to run this program here it's not going to work. I need the ARM hardware by which I, through some technique, I have to download this application to the file system. So either through Flash or JTAG or some media on the actual target. Okay, yeah. Isn't it? But yeah. here to test it, we can use the QEMU. Oh, okay. So now we can do what is we can run QEMU ARM and then specify this sample.r. The moment I do this, it will look for the dynamic linker to load this application. Now this support has to be provided by the tool chain, right? Because see, currently when we run this application, yeah. this application has to be emulated under a environment, which is this EXE. Yeah. Yeah. So this program is capable of understanding all the instruction which is there in this EXE file. Yeah. So I need the dynamic loader to be pointing it to here or linker to be pointing here. Now, where is that installed? The installation directory. So in my case, opt code source rate, source rate G++ like R norm. So this is, you know, you saw the diagram which I showed you. Yeah. Yes, no, you right? Yeah. Yeah. So after that installation, the path where you have given, there is where it gets stored. That's all. It is simple. Mm -hmm. So now, this is the place where you can see the library is there. Lib. Architecture specific libc. Lip. Mm -hmm. But I think even libc is sufficient because that's enough the path. So I need to specify this that go and pick it up from you. Okay. That's all. So I would say arm dash qemu dash arm and then dash l. Dash l means to link mm -hmm. the path from this library mm -hmm. and then my actual file name which was sample.arm So now what it does, it searches in the directory for the dynamic loader link. And as you can see, the results are out. So I don't need to have an ARM hardware to perform this particular test. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, can, yeah. can this uh, path I mean, this yeah. uh, on non Linux, Linux the yeah. right path. So that can be made uh, like uh, universal. I mean, you can access it from, from anywhere. Uh, uh, universal in the sense, uh -huh. I can set the path for sure. Oh, okay. 
Okay. It's like, see, when we want to run this, probably we can put this across in a script so that it can be very easy running. Oh, okay. okay. Say, we can write a script, QEM, ARM, and this becomes common. Okay. And this becomes a command line argument. So it becomes automatic. Mm -hmm. See, the reason for not making it globally, you know, right? Because there might be a lot of native application. I, I, I mean to say global, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so making native programs yeah. will get hit. We can make it global. For example, we can export the path. Okay. okay. Like what we have done here is in my, you know, the profile file. You see. Um, you can see I placed the path over here. Okay. So like this, you know, different, you know, paths can be set for different compiler versions also, right? Because see, sometimes what happens, you might be having a compiler, which is compiling a V4 architecture. And sometimes you may require a V5 architecture, correct? Mm -hmm. So yeah. in order to, you know, like uh, control that, it's always good that you explicitly specify the library path. So those applications are reading from a specific version of the library distribution. So that's only the thing. Otherwise, definitely we can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Now, uh, let's get into if you were to emulate the hardware, you know, from the um, system perspective, you know. So um, yeah. Um, Go ahead. Sorry, animation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we use this QEMU, so what's what's the output of that? I mean. So, I mean, if yeah. this is just to check if my code exactly, is... Exactly, exactly. If my application has to be tested, I can quickly test my application rather than testing it on the hardware. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, if there is yeah. any issues, then... I, we can go those... back. Yeah, go back to the source code, quickly kill this and do it. So I don't need to spend too much of time in interacting with a test bit. That's the whole idea. Oh, okay, okay. Rather than sitting on the hardware and you know breaking head, and you know if if you have uh, some wrongly programs being executed by you, I mean it can cause some more damage. Yeah. Instead of spoiling the actual pins, first better test it on the emulator. Okay. And then you know you come back to test it on your application. Okay. Yeah. Thank so you. This is yeah. So this is but very powerful for doing the even the all the other you know library and other stuff also. Okay. So let's say if I want to you know now build the library if you remember we had a lib demo mm -hmm. so just wanted to verify okay. that it's more like a repeat but for an architecture that's it okay so I that's mean, what uh, it's widely used uh, heavily used heavily used okay. heavily i mean even qualcomm is using it oh, okay. uh, broadcom has its uh, internal emulator build on this mm -hmm. okay. and then we have uh, cisco using it uh, Google is using it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember I was giving a session to KP's team, Krishna Prasad team. Oh, Krishna Prasad. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. KP, you may be known. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, I know. yeah. yeah. yeah he uh, has so many patents in his name. <laughs> he <got laughs> recently. <laughs> uh, he's a junior to me. I don't know, Asan in there, actually. Very yeah. good. Oh, he studied in Asan? Asan College. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> that guy is also like, yeah, he's pretty, you know, sharp, very sharp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with his team and all, we had given a QEMU interactions and the training program. He also had come and attended my session there. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, and, uh, at Aris only. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they are also trying to see if, you know, they can create some quick emulators like this, you know, like the way you were saying, you know, thin clients and terminal kind of yeah. programs. And yeah. Now imagine that entire set of features and all applications and all. Yeah. And test it here in, uh, in the you know UI only. Why we need the entire box to come and have a redundant hardware to apply all this. Yeah. yeah. Typically, it is very good for network-based application. You know. Okay. Like, you know, you want to test something on TCP IP or protocol side or you're tuning something or mm -hmm. some kind of a VPN connection you want to do. You don't want to break the head on the hardware. So you just test it here and it, if it works here, you can emulate this environment. Uh, you can definitely work on the target board. Oh, okay. Okay. So, yeah. So just to extend, uh, yeah. Most of the times, uh, like we ask for reference boards from the. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if this can help uh, with that, I mean. Yeah. yeah, by the time the board comes, no, you can be roughly like 30-40% ready with your application. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. Parallel yeah. development, you know. Okay. Yeah. So QEMU is meant for that. I mean, you know, I, what I would uh, suggest is that if you get some time, you can uh, try to, you know, yes. extend a little bit on, on QEMU. I know time is tough, to, but uh, yeah. it's, it's a good emulator. It's a good emulator. For hardware, so it is a, like, you know, for engineers, hardware engineers, it is like a boon for us. Yeah, true. I mean, most probably, I, mean, yeah. I, might, I might approach you for one more session on that. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, surely, surely, surely. You can. When you get a time, when you get time, yeah. I will, I will. Yeah, yes. thank you. So that's, that's, of course, there anytime. Yeah. Now let's just try to emulate the same thing by using, you know, that um, um, the library building. If you remember, we were trying to build a library once. And I had a lib demo prepared for you and we had tried to build the static library and dynamic library if you remember yeah yeah yes. yeah so one second yeah no problem no problem go 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 there don't disturb me yeah wow wow sorry anish <laughs> you have to say please go then he will <laughs> they kids <will. laughs> <laughs> Can you please go into that room? Okay, I'll okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. So, math.c and then we are in the current directory. And then we have a YouTube page in the current directory. And then I'll have a. So here again, you know, the, the commands, do you had a chance to remember these commands? Only thing is I'm going to change the architecture now. So I'll just say that ARM, MOM, GNU, or Linux, GNU, GCC, dash C, string dot C, map dot C, right? Yeah. And then I'll have an archive command. Again, note that it will be again cross AR. And then I'll have a uh, lib. Yes, you too. And dot a file, and then we add what string dot o and then dot o. Yeah. So AR needs a command. Replace cs rcs switch. So now we got the library here, and then we'll go for building the exe file. So I'll say app dot c minus o. Okay. And then I'll give app dot Say so arm exe file, and I'll give the library to link it. Yeah, okay. that's one way. Another was caps l. Say that library is in my current directory, and then linking option. Yes, you do. Okay. So now what happened? Again, we got an arm file ready, but it cannot execute on your my PC, right? So again, I run the same stuff. Same link. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, QMU and dash arm and then dash L. Once more, I'll just repeat this. Oct, code source, source red plus plus light, arm on this, and Lipsy. So let him look into library and Lipsy. Can you see that? Yes. Oh. So, I'm, you know, like, Quickly testing my application rather than breaking my head on the okay, how do I test it? You know? Oh wow! Okay. So this is something which is really uh, advantageous. So tomorrow you don't need to have the board to come, then we have to flash it, and then have the kernel running, and then have the application uh, root file system up and the bootloader up, and then only we can perform the test, right? Yes. Okay. So application programmer can focus on building apps, and they can test it quickly that hey, it's working. Now let's see the you know resultant. Maybe if you want to have a profiling of the timing, that, that may not be a very good idea, right? Yes. Or okay. you want to test the camera's uh, image of SMC, that may not work. I mean, you definitely need a hardware. There's no doubt. Okay. Uh, so I have a gyrometer and I want to check my games is working well or not. I mean, those simulations are limited, right? That's limited. 
But yeah. if I'm running some application, some yeah. code that that I have written, so yeah. in any way, like uh, like we know that uh, what is the CPU utilization, or it's not up to that level. I mean, it, uh, in this, it is not up to that level. But there is a system mechanism by which we can do that, where you build the entire system. Uh, now, I know it will be very uh, this one to you, but a demonstration I can give it to you. Okay, okay. I mean, just, just as just as you are. Yeah. As a curiosity, what happens is, in see, to evaluate and profile an application, you need tools, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, if you consider the all the kind of tools which we have, we usually run it on the host machine on the PC side, right? Yes. Yeah. Now QMU itself is an emulator of that particular application. Mm -hmm. So I need a way to emulate the entire application, which is compiled with this option for the switch. Okay. What I mean by this is, if I were trying to uh, perform a code coverage, say, mm -hmm. or if I want to perform a profiling and timing of any function, say, then I can do that by using some unique commands on that architecture. Okay. okay? For that, I should have my, you know, uh, the root file system up and running. So I can perform and do that job. Otherwise, that will be a limitation. Okay. Uh, how? I can show you on a desktop. How do we do that? And then we move there. Okay. okay. And let's see how, how you do that. Uh, so we'll take an example of instrumenting the code. Okay. okay. And uh, you know, I will take one program from some place. Maybe I have some demo. So maybe it's one of the experiment I had here. So let's look at this, you know, experiment C file. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know about how much time these functions uh, takes for, you know, profiling itself. There is a session, but uh, anyway, we are, now you have asked, so I'll finish this part. On the code coverage because memory leaking and other things is yet left, right? We have to complete that also. Yes. So how did you work? And yeah, all those things is left. So that. If you notice that we have two functions here, one is A and the other one is B, and we're trying to give some load here. Like this is going for 100,000 times, this yes. 400,000 times. And in main, I'm trying to accept something from a command line argument. So you can see here, the RV of one, RV of zero is file name, one is the command. When you pass this, I am using this ATOI. You know why we use this, right? Remember? Uh, yes. Um, so this is... Uh, like we had a string yeah. and a string to a integer conversion. Yeah, so we try to convert that integer, take this in the iteration here, mm -hmm. and then we keep looping both the functions. So say in command line argument, if you pass say 500, mm -hmm. so 500 times, A will run for 10,000 times and B is going to loop over 48,000, 400,000 times, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now we want to perform a profiling on this particular. Okay. So how do we do that is uh, GCC. And we enable the profiling. See, at the compilation itself, I can do this job. Mm -hmm. This switch will enable the profiling code for me. And now, when I run this a.out file, I'll have to specify, say, I'll run it for 5,000 times. So now what's happening here? The program is getting instrumented at runtime. Okay. Okay. And yeah. And now you will notice that there is a file called as what? gmon.out file being created. This is a profiled data file. Okay. You can see here. This is a performance data. So instrumentation has recorded the performance program when you ran this. And to test this, we will be using a command gprop. And then we will use some option of exe file, which is my a.out file. And I'll list this up. Mm -hmm. 
Now, as you can see, it has generated a flat profile out of this execution. Oh, okay. And now you're able to see the time-wise distribution of the parts of your functions which you ran in the program. So you can easily pick up the hotspots. You got it, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. See, if I have a large project and if I have some hundreds of uh, functions being participating in my application, mm -hmm. I might be worried about which function is taking how much of time and, you know, uh, overall commutative time is how much for execution, right? Yeah. And you want to profile that and see if, you know, if, if there is a function which is very overloaded and it's taking too much time, is there any way to optimize or reduce or, you know, I mean, weighing the options. Okay, okay. So gprof you to profile instrument the program and it says see there are two functions which you call it. name is b and a mm -hmm. and for the main outer we were giving the command as 5000 types of iteration happened yes. correct yeah from the command line and it was noticed that 6.42 seconds was executed by b and 1.49 yeah. so overall you know completion time by a it will be you know added together here. This is seconds, self-seconds, cumulative seconds. Okay. Now all the meaning of this is actually specified here. So this means what? Percentage time. The explanation for this is here. Cumulative times oh, okay. by sum of number of seconds accounted for. The number of seconds accounted for this, which is this. Number of calls or times this function was involved. Else blank. So, you know, the description is here, but this is a very fantastic way of, you know, trying to create a call graph of an application and say how your application executed. Now you can see here, it's showing the planularity, which is a, a hit for every four bytes on 0 0.1 per and 7.1 second. It means less than a percent was hit uh, uh, for 7.9 seconds of execution time. It means uh, program is still fast. And mm -hmm. now to look for self children and called some spontaneous hit they will do. Every time you run this program, you will get some spontaneous load because this program may also compete with other applications which are running, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, like say some 50 threads are running and 100 threads are running or 200 threads are running. The forms will be having also a difference, right? Because because app, other applications will also be a part of uh, the hardware execution, right? So your competitive completion time may differ. Okay. But with respect to A and B, this would all, almost remain the same, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's what it's trying to show you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Doesn't it? Like, yeah. So see, if you say 6.4 and 1.49, this combines together is 7.9, right? Yeah. 9 into 11, 1 and for eight or nine, six plus one seven, yeah. correct? Yeah. yeah. So that makes it. Then it's also trying to show the relation that if main and B is compared, that's the total amount of time which you have compared, spent. So out of 100%, when the application run, roughly 81.2% time, it is B who is dominating inside me rather than me. Okay. Okay. So, you know, we can get into some kind of, uh, you know, profiling. So, okay. Got it. Yeah. yeah. So I hope it answers you to some extent. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now you know the same stuff could be tried to repeat it by an ARM stop. So we can try this ARM norm. And G Linux. So now it's going to be something like this. And and then we can have. Uh, So while we were executing this, uh, we got to see that it runs through R dash QMUR, sorry. Dash L. And again, should search for a shortcut. Q E U dash R. No, it doesn't help me. C++ 
So this is trying to run an Ombox now, simulation. See, uh, so it's trying to, you know, even give a feeling of that you're really working on ARM. It's pretty slow in execution because <laughs> the CPU will be a little slower than the PC, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So but, can, ARM, ARM is slower? Uh, of course. I mean, in compared to the desktop which we are having. <laughs> 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 we have bigger power, right? I mean, yeah, Intel yeah. is very, really, very really fast. <laughs> yeah. But so QMU is trying to, you know, give that correct feeling, like and trying to be closer to hardware acceleration. Oh, okay. okay. So I really love this. I mean, I've been using this for the last 12 years. Okay. It was in early days when I started, it was QMU 0 0.14. It was in beta version when I started contributing. Oh, okay. Now it's pretty heavy. It's like 4.x. Mm -hmm. Very stable. Mm -hmm. okay. And yeah. Freeware, right? I mean... Sorry, it's it's a freeware. I mean, it's a yes, of course, a free source from all the hardware vendors. Now, are very exciting. What they are doing is instead of hardware coming up, they provide all this. You can emulate and quickly test a lot of ideas which you have, rather than you know breaking your head on a box. Oh, okay. People were very and see something like you know running as a exe also. See on an today I have an infrastructure called as a server which is running on an x86 machine, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, if I have to run an ARM application on this, what do I do? I can run them. You know, say if I have some uh, proprietary application which requires ARM environment, mm -hmm. I need to take an actual hardware and then connect through some chassis or some network to my another server, okay. yeah. which is wrong. Instead of yeah, instead of that, just virtualize and run it on top. That's it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. that's much faster. So that technique is heavily being used. Instead of taking hardware and all and then find a physical connection to run them all. Run these programs as if it is an EXE and use a communication channel to send the data and throw it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, you know, like the way instead of having a, a hardware defined network, now we have a software defined network, right? SDN. Yes. It's a GNU radio from ages, right? Not today. Yeah, yeah. The same logic is there, but now we have the infrastructure where we can emulate all this stuff. So okay. instead of doing a network planning physically and creating nodes and then connecting a hell of a lab and having instructors and CCN certified guy, yeah. I'll just run a SDN uh, uh, planner application which will perform the job and move it, isn't it? True. Yeah. yeah. So that's how it is. So, I mean, uh, uh, so th the uh, architecture, I mean, if there are many versions of, like, for example, R. Ah. So they keep updating, right? I mean, ARM V8 or... Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So what, what happens is, say for example, you know, when we use this QE, MU, uh, system ARM, right? Mm -hmm. Here, it gives you all the hardware supported. So there is something called as machine, okay? Mm -hmm. And there you can say help. So all the help will give you all the machine type. Here. Like you can see here, versatile PA, PB, RT, 992JS, 4. Right? Oh, okay. Real view, baseboard, R926. We express A9, Cortex A9. Mm, awesome. okay. Right? Cortex A9 is A10, A15, PX8 to 70, Xilinx, mm -hmm. ZQ, again PX70. Okay. We express A15, you can see Cortex A15, A15. Cortex A8. So it means these hardwares can be easily tested. Oh, okay. So, I mean, yeah. they keep updating and... <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so, so tomorrow, yeah, they keep updating, of course. So tomorrow, if I wanted to know about, uh, you know, PA or PV, uh, so, you know, billion dollar architecture, billions of devices are wanting, working on this. Mm -hmm. Millions of devices are powered and still being supported from kernel, you know. You'll be shocked that this architecture is the latest 5.0 kernel on the box which is rare on every box, you know? Yeah. One of the biggest challenge we all face is how to give the backward compatibility. Okay. ARM versatile PV is one of that architecture which is completely backward compatible and forward compatible with all the kernel version which is released, which is amazing. Okay. Yeah, so this, yeah, so you can get the style version. This is the hardware. 
board which we are trying to emulate there. Okay. Okay. You got it. Yeah. It's an IBA. This is PV version, mm -hmm. and you know. Mm -hmm. So, okay. actually, if you look at the hardware description, all the target stuff which ARM is providing, all this, right? Oh, you are I see Ethernet interface. I mean, you can have USB. Yeah. Or, oh, that's nice. Okay. So all this you can test it, mm -hmm. GPIO and other. Mm -hmm. And you can pass it. For example, you want to re rebuild the entire kernel with some drivers up. You can test that. Yeah. Okay. Damn powerful. Damn powerful. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, you know, like say, if I want to build something, I can show you something. Let's say, okay. Uh, I can show you at least an inception today. A dream within a dream kind of stuff. So this is an emulator. I mean, already we are running on a uh, we this virtual box, you know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is also built on a QMU emulator, by the way. Okay. So yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, I want to show you one of the machine which we can run with. I can give the flash memory how much I want. Yeah. So these switches, no, by which you can specify. So dash M refers to which hardware architecture you want to emulate. What should be my SDRAM and flash size? Okay. What is going to be, which kernel version do you want to load over here? So you can use a kernel switch also. Okay. So, BPB. Then you have a root file system you can load. You pass some key as well, like this. Uh, you know, like how do you pass the command line arguments to the kernel? And all. So, where do you want to mount it? So, I want to run it. I want to start the init process. And uh, let's see. System R. V E R S A T I V E. So now, can you see something else happening? Yeah. So what we are doing is we are booting another kernel here. Just like the ARM is using a kernel which you have built for ARM, you have a root file system over there, you have an application, mm -hmm. and then you have a console, you can get a shell as well here. You see that? Yeah. So it's... It's, it's like Linux within Linux within Linux within yeah. Linux. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So tomorrow I can go to proc and I can, you know, say, uh, cat uh, proc uh, slash proc slash CPU info. Mm -hmm. You can see what it says. ARM 926EJ is revision 5, something like this. That's the time. So all these commands in which you are seeing is an ARM architecture running and booting. Uh, this is the same thing you get through a hyper terminal or a minicom, right? Yeah, it's as good as like... Yeah, I mean, getting a serial console access. So you <laughs> exactly. Instead of doing that, uh, you can also do a serial port uh, studio IO also. So if I'm not interested, I can also append this. I can say, say, guys, uh, serial should be different. I can say serial is equal to studio. Uh, type of, yeah. So you see something like this, yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, it won't show anything on the box only here. It will also say here. You can see here also, which is going Okay, so studio will also have the console. 
that's all. So we can redirect this through different terminal drivers also, you know, which is our job. I mean, you know, so it's pretty strong. Actually. You know, like QDTS files and this is strong, very damn strong. So you, you got the view, right? And yeah, I, I, I got it. Yeah. 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 Stuff. I mean, we can build these all things. I mean, building kernel and drivers and all, you know. Mm -hmm. I hope you're not taking it as a part or something. Uh, <laughs> it's just that we're not covering everything in the embedded C. That's the thing. I know. Yeah, I understand. It's, yeah. It's, it's vast. Uh, yeah. yeah. But this is how you could test it. You know, you could build. So, you know, tomorrow you should be able to build your own kernel. If you're, you should okay. be able to build your own root file system. You should be able to bring them up. You should be able to change, add some more application, install your own driver. Mm -hmm. Just then. All. So, I mean, you should be able to debug, remote debug it. You know, so okay. instead of you know you connecting it manually, you can connect to a GDB server and debug it. So it's pretty strong, actually. Okay. And it also, I mean, so, can, uh, the bootloader. We can use this for. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. We okay. can use U-boot to build it. We can re we can re cross compile the entire U-boot, and you can take the U-boot image and push it inside, and it will show you the U-boot uh, command as well. You know. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if I have something already built in. That's also pretty interesting. Because, you know, as a hardware guys, we are very, always worried about that, right? Yeah. <laughs> can, we, can we get that console, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I can show you that. Mm -hmm. I'm testing it. Just give me a second. I built some U boot recently for some box. Uh, Downloads. Yeah, I think here we may have some files. Yeah, you have a U boot here. Oh, yeah, exactly. So, so I could say, so you would uh, and it can go to my. Very strong. You'll feel like you know you don't need the hardware after this. <laughs> no serial port, no hyper terminal, and serial port and laptop and all can be thrown. The old laptop you can throw it and buy a new one. <laughs> Just everything. You remember we had a dark box actually in the background. Dell, that those Dell series uh, laptops were very popular for that. <laughs> <laughs> there used to be a dock station when you connect that all oh, the, the dock station, yeah, yeah. yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I am done with it long back <laughs> yeah it's i mean it's shrinking the hardware is definitely i mean <laughs> yeah i mean yeah So no graphic is correct. And then dash kernel. Yeah. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah. So now your all the favorite commands, you know, D and V and all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so D and V, set D and V and Yeah, all all the you have to be careful in typing. You know, it's no more a shell by the way, okay? So all this is there. 
Yeah. Okay, so this is you would shell is yours. You do whatever you want. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's pretty. This is pretty nice. I mean, <laughs> damn cool. I didn't get right? this this information. Yeah. 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 So you so got it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, and then through here you can you know configure say like you know TFTP boot and all you can configure on your PC. Same here itself, and right. from there you know you can give the path. That it is my this directory you read it from. Yeah, so okay. instead of you know taking the Z modem and downloading and breaking your head and all those things, yeah. you need to just give a switch and move ahead. Yeah. Yes. Because what is required is for testing my application is properly working or not. My driver is properly working or not. Exactly. Yeah. If those all testing is done, then we'll load it on a hardware and sit one day. No worries. Yeah. 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 So it really speeds up the testing. Okay. Reboot. What happened? Oh, is it not configured for me? Ah, boot PI. Okay. There should be reset, right? Something like we used to have a reset button. Um, yeah, usually boot should work, I think. Uh, boot should work, yeah. Yeah. Boot. Ah, resetting. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> ah, reset. So that's what I was trying. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So pretty, pretty, you know, yeah, pretty uh, strong stuff here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which is uh, which we can do. So I mean, first I wanted to expose you to to you know this aspects that you know if you have to perform the whatever we learned, right? Yeah. Yeah. All these applications have to be cross built and test something like this. It's almost one and the same. Mm -hmm. But once you get to know, okay, this is how we can do it. It can be tried out on your box or you can try it on your home also, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this was one of the aspects. Now let's move to, you know, uh, talking about the performance, memory leaking, okay. and debugging those memory leaks, tenses, and okay. so and so on, you know? Okay. So maybe can we take a five minutes break or something and then start? Yeah. And <laughs> have a coffee and come? That'll be good. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Hmm? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. I'll, I'll mute it and. Uh, no, no problem. Sure.
Hello. Hal. Yeah, it's not working. So, so what do we do? Throw it in the trash? Hello? Hi, Animesh. Hey, hi, hi. There? Yeah. So, shall we get started? Sure, sure, please. Yeah, yeah. Now, another thing is about the code coverage. I'm sure you guys are also using some code coverage. So are you instrumenting the program right now? Um, I mean, this is I mean, Android. Uh, so we huh. just use the emulator and uh, you test phone and yeah. OK. I mean, so. Oh, OK, got it. So you, you are like, uh, you're building the images and adding some components, building the entire image. Yes, yes. And then you're fusing the image on SD card or something, and then you're bringing up, or maybe directly on the ADB. And this is my... It's uh, directly on the ADB. Oh, OK. Yeah. So, you know, see, there also you must have chosen some emulator, right? You must create an emulator, no? The target de details and all before you do it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the Android Studio has... Uh, yeah, well, you have Android Studio. Yeah. They allow you to create a new target, right? The target. Yes. And yeah. You can choose a version of the Android, like you want Oreo or and, uh, or whatever. API. And the Arch API, yeah. And the API version, like maybe SDK, NDK 13 or 16 or 18, 17, like that. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, um, see, there is something more which we call it about code coverage. Code coverage, basically, we use from synopsis, covered. I believe uh, Kuvati is also used by RS, if I remember, from so. Synopsis. Okay. Um, your OBS is a little breaking, Animesh. I could. Can I, can I, hang on. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, I can, I can hear you now. Better? Okay. Yes, better. Yeah. So I was saying here this. Coverty is a very nice uh, profiling software, instrumentation software. Coverty. Coverty. So I think I have uh, mistyped it. Yeah. It's coverty. So this is the, you know, the entire, you know, code coverage. Uh, yeah. Mm. So, so. Okay. So, entire, you know, you can do the static code analysis for all the basic applications and all. Pretty strong. Mm -hmm. And it's also built on the GNU tool chain called as uh, GCOG. So I'm seeing you will be seeing a command line. What these people do is they integrate with your ID and okay mm -hmm. as a tool, and then you know uh, you can see you know more graphical report than actually you know, uh, doing it manually. So they will help you integration to be done for you. You know, pretty good. And we have been using this even our code base in the past. Oh, okay. So this is built on this same concept which I'm trying to explain you right now. There is a code coverage utility, you know, okay. and uh, so let's take a very uh, simple example, like you know, cov dot uh, c file, and okay. 
and you know this is a simple code which we want to deduct that what part of the piece was executed and what remain untested you know okay so the whole idea of this like say we run application we may have some hundreds of use cases and we would have designed some test cases around it we run the app and then you know we want to know that you know what part of the code got executed and what left untested so before we go to the box whether the code coverage is done 70% 80% 90% or 100% mm -hmm. based on that we decide the check in actually so okay. yeah so in this a very simple example to demonstrate this see here we have uh, uh, this program when it runs uh, this for loop may run for how many times? Mm. 10 times? 10 times, yes. Expected. Yeah. How about this if statement will be executed for? Uh, uh, nine, nine times? Nine times, yeah. Yeah, it has to execute for nine times. Yeah. And this line might execute for th three times, right? Yeah, three times. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? I mod three, so up to 10 we are. So three, six, nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so three times. And this part again will run for ten times. I'm sorry, nine times. Nine times. Yeah, but this will never execute. Big, yeah, yes. Correct. Yeah. So like like this, you know, there may be a very large source code and we want to know what part ran, what part was untested. So I'm not sure for some reason if this condition becomes true at the field, what will be the scope? Will it run or not? Is it tested? Okay. You getting me? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's the part of the code coverage. So we want to be absolutely sure that all the part of the code base which is there, mm -hmm. there are scenarios, enough scenarios and test cases generated so that they all get executed so that there is no surprises on the field. I mean, this is a noble thought. We know that the music will come from field only. That is fine. Yeah, true. <laughs> but an anticipation is that you know you always want to yeah, <laughs> reduce yeah. and minimize the errors. Yeah. <laughs> true, true. So you know, like, so to, how we do that is by attaching coverage in profile. So I can use a GCC with some unique switches. Like one is the profile for architecture. So the profile arcs. Profile arcs is a switch which we use it for including architecture specific uh, instrumentation. It means be very strict about the architecture you are uh, profiling the code for. Okay. And then the entire code must be test covered. So F, test coverage. So these are two core switch via which we compile our program. This switch is will actually enable the instrumentation part when we run this program. So the moment I say something like dot slash a dot out, the program will run now, right? So while exe is running, it will generate some file for us. Some GCDA file kind of some data, sample data will be generated out of it. As you can see, this is the data created, like file of dot g c d a so data file it's a binary type data so you cannot make much out of it mm -hmm. okay yeah but this will be given as an input when you so this becomes a reference data file when you want to execute this with a coverage so you ran the program first as that a dot out first and then after this you run gcov command and then follow this with your source code which is gov.c now as you can say that he says that line executed so roughly 87 percent of the code is covered it means it was tested okay and it generates the file to have a view for you now this file we can open up gov dot c dot G code. Now let's read this. You know, the dash in the left hand side here refers that they are not going to be a part of the execution. 
Okay. Okay. And when you run this program, you ran this program twice actually. So it has kept a track for coverage. Mean ran for two times. Oh, okay. For was run twice. So we executed twice. So what happened? 20 times instead of 10. Okay. This ran for nine. This is not, sorry. It did was, it's a body. Here, instead of nine, it has become 18 times. Executed for six times. Again, tested for 18 times, never executed. So this pound refers to that you were not a part of test. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we can call the you know developers and the team members from tester and say, guys, this is something what is going on. Why these parts of the codes are not getting executed? And if the code coverage is like 30%, 40% is very poor, you should never actually release such kind of code. It's like, you know, 60, 70% of the code is never executed oh, okay. on the target. So <laughs> you want to release that for yeah. some event if it rises and if those codes, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we know. Another thing is, also, tell you, yeah. people don't do this, they don't care. <laughs> I mean, uh, space. It also occupies the space, right? In the flash. I mean, if, yeah. Uh, I mean, if we don't use it, maybe we can. That's that's the point. I mean, the, this is like you know, before before it goes to the release, no test bed. No instrumentation is a very time-consuming job. You know, right? Yes. Yeah. So it, these all activity will be very very slow activities. People who don't want to get into this headache. Mm -hmm. okay. And seniors, so you know, like they know that what is going on. So hey, we have to do all the things. Yeah. Anyway, when the customer will ask, we know where to fix it. Okay. So usually what happens, uh, you know, this can cause challenges, I mean. So people who have reached to the place where they manually can understand what's going on. You know, I've been working on a project and a product for the last 20 years, 15 years. I have a complete idea about what changes and what places the changes have to meet. Almost even line numbers are mugged up by us, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you go there and change that one and build and it will work. That's it. Okay. So it's working. Uh, so that is experience, of course. But large source code coverage must be performed. And we must find ways to, you know, like uh, execute. Okay. So I'm just trying to, you know, remove these files once. Just for columns. For C. For RM. For dot C. Dot G. And you just want to show you now, we'll change this file. Let's go to C. Because see, when you write embedded software, so the embedded C code must be code covered. I remember Parasoft was heavily being used by us. Which, which one? Uh, Parasoft. Parasoft, oh, okay. okay. So they have a complete static profiling and for even hard real time system. Okay. Eleven. Yeah. You know, so I just want to do something like you know a scan F. Okay. Mod D and address of this limit. Just trying to ensure that we check all the possibilities. And then we will try to recompile this program. So I use the control R to recall that. And now you know I have to run this call file. And it's waiting for me. So I'll say something like 100. So you can see it. Hello. So you can see here. It means now it is giving a reference that all the parts of the program has been tested. Okay. Yeah. 
Hello? Right, uh, yeah. So 100%, I mean, it is very rare to get a 100% code coverage win. Very difficult. On yeah. the trivial program, it is fine. But hard real-time application must do this. Like if you're writing some professional audio application or something, mm -hmm. well, there's no chance. I mean, you have to take care of little, uh, smallest of the interference also, which should not come up and should create it. Okay. And, you know, that takes time. Let's open the file and see. It must have recorded this. So, cop.c gcop yeah so we entered 100 so four was for 100 times if executed 90 times we tested this code 33 times same here 99 times this also code was executed for nine times and we don't see any crashes so looks like it's a robust code so module wise we can do this you know so one logic what we can use instead of code covering the entire you know uh, say a thousand files we can enable the switch only in the make file of that directory you got it no? yeah yeah so, so suspicious models which are having some challenges so in that case no, the build will not be good otherwise the build takes huge amount of time okay. so we should not enable the switch for all the you know directory structure and source codes only the ones which we are building or adding, say, component, there are some standard components. Okay. There you cannot play anything because it's distributed by some third-party license or binary license or vendor, right? Yes. Yeah. What's the thing is that I am plugging in now my proprietary stuff or some kind of uh, you know application which I have. That at least we can code cover and send it is what my thought is on this. Okay. So this is very important for, you know, as a part of all the writing, optimized code and investigating application, uh, extremely important. Yeah. Okay, now let's get into the heap related memory management stuff. Okay. So, we want to get into a lot of uh, concepts. So first is, you know, one of the challenge which we all face is in the leak and uh, reduction first and foremost, you know. Mm -hmm. And second thing is the memory error also. It means segmentation faults. Okay. Well, problem with these kind of programs are leak don't show, you know, right? I mean, it, it's like a happening in the background and, you know, you, you just... I mean, assume that there is a leak going on. You, you, you can't say that it's a leak, you know, because hogging up the memory may be a default uh, behavior of an application. You know, you got that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yes. Here, one small example where we are trying to continuously allocate a memory and free them. Mm -hmm. And some of them, we don't care to free them. As you can see here, continuously, there are some leaks going on. Okay. The first one is fine. After that, you're continuously allocating chunks of memory. But what about the previous memory? They all are getting leaked because we aren't freeing them, isn't it? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Here also, uh, but you will never reach. It was while one, F1. So you can't reach line number 22. Isn't it? Onwards. Yes, yes. Because F1 will keep running all the way. Yeah. Yeah. So when you, you know, compile this program and want to tr run this, uh, say GCC memleak and say dot out, you can tra track the memory leak. Because see, it's a very silent thing. You don't know whether it's leaking or not. So some commands, you know, like say cat proc. And I can use the process ID. Mm -hmm. And then I can have something like maps, you know. And I can grip heap over there. So it will give me the address which it is consuming. So this is the higher address and this is the lower address. Okay. If we subtract this from this, we get the actual memory right now it is consuming. Mm -hmm. So what this Catproc PID maps is doing is it is trying to get the memory map. Okay, currently of a running process. Okay. okay. And it is giving you the report. 
uh, I took some time and again I ran the program. Can you see there is an increase in this address? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Another way you can also perform this is by using a PMAP command and you can put something like uh, uh, P21001. Okay. PMAP, sorry, just a PID. Okay, what has happened here is um, option dash X here. Yeah. Doesn't take me. Oh, it's triple zero. That's the reason. Yeah. So as you can see, there is some memory which is being allocated and will be increasing over a period of time. Let's try to just check that. Can you see this part? This is 792 K. Yeah. Still the same. Yes. We have to so anonymous memory, which you see, right? That's the one which allocates the heap area. Okay. 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 So you know, after some time, can yeah. you see there is an increase? Yeah. So you know, it will keep eating this memory. It's like you know, early sucking the RAM till the RAM is out. Yeah. Yeah. And then there will be an out of memory hit from the kernel, which we say out of memory. Ooms. So you know, they maintain a score that beyond that particular memory, say. Every process can attain maybe one gig of such heap memory. If you go beyond that heap memory, it will start being killed by the app, uh, kernel itself. Okay. Even Android does the same thing, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They have an ASH yeah. memory management yeah. driver. I mean, right now, um, um, and I hear, I heard uh, Surya is uh, working on some uh, application where Android, uh, some product, um, uh, uh -huh. Android application is just eating up all the RAM. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They are RAM suckers actually. Struggling to <laughs> figure out why it's happening. why is it so? why is it so? Yeah, yeah. You should say why don't you run a PMAP on the backs? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I think we should give him a uh, uh, hint of you know yeah. as a part what of I, a small. What I what I heard is they have hmm. increased the the memory allocation, the lower memory. Is that sounds ah. sounds right? Yeah, that is correct. Oh, okay, okay. Because I, I'm not, I was, I'm not involved in the project, but I uh, uh, keep hearing so some, some terms. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> no, but it is true because see the lower memory increasing. What happens is the application also starts hogging high memory, you know, very huge memory. Oh, okay, okay. So, but what they should do is see there is something which we put a score for every process, you know. Mm -hmm. So in Android, you no, know, there's a mechanism to put the score for every. Um, hey, your, your voice is a little breaking. Uh. 400 is Okay, hang on. Hang on. Uh, give me a minute. I'll try to. Sure. Thank you. Hey, Anira. Hello, is it better now or? Yeah, it, it's it's better now. Um, okay. Like I can. Hang on one second. I'll just stop the sharing. I'll stop the sharing. Maybe oh. just you stay there. I'll log out and log in again and see if it works or something. Sure. I'll I'll. Uh, leave yeah, just hang there. Yeah. I'll leave the meeting. So I'll. And I will also be. Meeting.
Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. I can hear. But yeah, there's some glitch. Even I can see from your side as well. Hang on. Yeah. I'm trying to you know, see if I can change the connection. Hang on. Okay. Let's see if it works with another box. So that's all. Hello. 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 Yeah. So is it better now? I think yeah, it, this is better. Yeah. I mean, you you, you can hear my voice, uh, Anish. I I can now. Yeah, I can definitely. Yeah. Now now this is better. Yeah. Yeah. See, you know, this application is already increasing. Consuming, and you know there will be a sign. But the problem is, you know, how do you say that it's leaking? Allocate self can be the default yeah. behavior of an application, isn't it? True. Yeah. So just by consuming the RAM, I can't say it's leaking. Yeah, I can't say it's leaking. So Correct. that's the thing. So you know, there are some tools which helps you to do it. Like you know, we know that Valgrind we use, and we can do that, right? You have tried that command. Mm -hmm. Now, another way to try out uh, the memory leaks or corruption is by using electric fence. Have you used it earlier in the past? No, I, no, I never, never used it. It's, okay. it's called electric fence? Uh, e fence, electric fence, yeah. Oh, e fence, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. New, new names you'll hear, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, yeah, I'm seeing. And uh, D malloc. So I'm just trying to kill this app. And I want to show you something more interesting, like how to deduct. See, some more surprising uh, programs. Can you see this application? Small program. Uh, so we accept the malloc, okay. and we are taking 25 bytes of allocation. But intentionally, I'm writing beyond 25. Okay. Okay. Now, my expectation is this program must crash here and here itself. Yes. Yeah. But what's surprising is it keeps smiling and running this application. So I'll say gcc hello.c and say it. Isn't it? Yeah. And this is very devastating. See, it's silently just simply running the program, which it was not supposed to. Correct. Yeah. Just to, you know, I have to add you more confidence in this. You see, this will be more bizarre. Now, in this code, I used a get s. Get s is anyway not going to check for my end of. So now I run a.out file. And now you see I'm sitting on the ski as long as we want to. And it's so surprising that the application is happily running. Yeah. Programmer will think that, you know, I have done a wonder program because only with 25 bytes, but I'm able to allocate one GB also. I mean, this is crazy. <laughs> yeah. And the problem is right now, there is no worry. The moment you install one or two or, you know, uh, launch one more two applications on your target box, mm -hmm. those applications will occupy memory and kernel will start tromping over this memory because kernel thinks that you only have demanded 25 bytes, right? Correct. Yeah. So yeah. because there is no other address in use, it's okay, isn't it? So, but this cannot happen as a box in the mercy of, you know, kernel. We have to break or crash this program much before. And that is where we use electric fence. Okay. We can 
we can like that's a kind of uh, you know malog debug so i'll show you in packaging uh, we can search for electric fence or you know again sudo app to get uh, electric dash fence okay. is the package name to install that i just wanted to show you here electric fence It's a debugger, you know, that will use the virtual memory hardware that will deduct illegal memory access. You can see very clearly, mm -hmm. and it can deduct both the common programming problem, software that overrides or underruns the boundaries of a malloc. Okay. So you know, you don't need to run a very heavy program like Valgrind. You know, sometimes architecture may not support those commands, right? Yes. Okay. So this definitely as a package will work. Right. Uh, it's so, for, um, debugging. Debugging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So what I have to do is while I'm compiling this program, I will link this program with this uh, library debugger. I'll say L E fence. And then I'll run the program A dot out file. You can see it's already giving me a, that it is recognized. Okay. Yeah. This guy has written the code. Mm -hmm. And now, if I sit on a key, I mean, it will go crash. Awesome. Okay. So, you know, it's a perfect test before it goes. This is perfect. This is perfect. Yeah. But the moment you go beyond the crib, that's gone. This is what we need. Oh. So override, underwrite, this can be easily deducted because see what happens is the application. See, this is, uh, you know, the Turing problem that N is not equal to NP. Say it's like, you know, the moment you get a magnetic tape mm -hmm. for putting an input on the keyboard, there's no way for anybody to stop till it reaches to the end of the tape. Yeah. It's like an array index, you know, right? So yeah, the yeah. moment I get the first character, till I keep sitting on the keyboard and reach to the end of it, there's no way to stop it. Correct. Yeah. So how do I do that? These kind of debuggers, what they do is they put some kind of a signature mark. Mm -hmm. So after 25 and before is zero to 25. So the moment you go beyond 25, it acknowledges that way. There is something beyond the signatures mm -hmm. has been override and hence it raises a seg, seg week. It's a, which is a segmentation fault to us, you know, okay. and the program crashes, which is a very good indication that, hey, so who is that guy who's sending the, either we should increase the size so that we can accept this if it is a requirement for us. Yeah. Assume that you are having a data channel where you have hundreds of bytes coming up. Okay, no problem. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So something. Now, there's one more thing which is very popular. You know, I, I fixed this for Orange, you know, long, long back when I was in Subex, you know. Uh, okay. There was one particular problem which we were facing in this station. There was a, you know, constant reset of a problem. And it was because of a memory leak was a question. I mean, we were not aware. Mm -hmm. And often what was happening is actually reset was happening. You know, today I have the data because uh, we saw it. And, uh, the board was resetting like roughly something like two years or you know 16 18 months uh, in once and nobody used to care yeah that's yeah true. who cares about you know like uh, yearly reboots purposes yeah 
uh, what was noticed is when we gave an upgrade on that box, you know, so we mm-hmm. launched a new new applications like, you know, free applications to the client just to attract them that, hey, this is a UI application, it's a health application. Okay. So what is going on in your box, everything can be visible or so. Okay. Yeah. Running on can't can't hear anything. Hello? And one was on RT Linux. And oh. suddenly three weeks of hello, Renu, I, can you hear me? I, I missed a couple of seconds before. Um, oh okay. Is it better now? Now I can hear, but suddenly it just drops. Wave drop. Oh, huh. Okay. Yeah, just... I'm sorry, I, I, I missed. Uh, um... No, no worries. What I was trying to say is, you know, yeah. that while uh, uh, we worked on uh, uh, the fact of that it was starting to, you know, upgrade with new application, all the sites were resetting the applications okay. with the hard way. And what we were thinking about is that the reset is a cause because of uh, uh, maybe a new application which has been launched. Okay. But it was the other way around. You know, what happened is that RAM consumption Mm -hmm. is basically, uh, say initially, the application was not GUI based. So, you know, the the consumption of RAM was less at that time, correct? Yeah, without GUI. Uh And, And so what was happening is, the, actually, the application is leaking, but it's leaking like, you know, too slow to be recognized. Got it, no? Oh, okay. Okay. And we were thinking that it's the new application which is causing the leak. <laughs> you hear that. <laughs> and, and, and what happened is the, the director was so unhappy. He said, just remove all these applications which you have given. I don't want these all kind of things. <laughs> okay. So everybody removed the application from the site. And again, every reset stopped. Oh, okay. <laughs> because the RAM... See, the consumption of RAM is say 12%, 13% <laughs> with the basic application. <laughs> the moment you added this, uh, you know, X based application, it started consuming 40% of the RAM. So now the filling of the RAM or completion of the RAM is much faster at the rate than actually it used to be earlier, you know? Yeah. Okay. So the, the leak was already. Uh, it was already there in the box, but okay. we were thinking it's a new app which is the culprit. Oh, okay. It was the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I came up with a situation that how we can, uh, uh, you know, fix it. Okay. okay. One second, when I have. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so how I was trying to fix here is I, I came to know about one mechanism called as malloc hooks. Okay. Uh-huh. At the time. And the hooks were a non printer it's like, you know, whenever you allocate a memory by using malloc, okay. you get a notification. And whenever you remove some memory, then you get another notification. So you could register a function which could do this kind of a job. Oh, okay. And, and that was interesting for me. So I thought, you know, why not we enable this kind of a feature in uh, 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 target hardware? But only the thing is on the sites, we cannot have this enabled. If you have enabled, it yeah. will become heavily slow. True. Yeah. yeah. Uh, right. So I mean, I cannot have a, a debug version running there. So I came out with another idea that on a socket, mm-hmm. um, why not we erase signals by which we can control? It means mm-hmm. we will take some peak time versus the least uh, active time of the client. Okay. Say you know, like client used to give us some window timing. Say one a.m. Uh, India time to two eleven. Or again, they used to give something like uh, 5.30 a.m. to say 7.11 a.m. So these used to be the you know, lower time usage. This means you know, their customers were not consuming the VSS more. So we could do some kind of gating there. Okay. okay. But rest all we cannot, you know, something like that. Mm-hmm. So I thought, why not we have a provision where manually from our site, from our satellite, from our site, mm-hmm. uh, we can enable these applications to start recording the memory profiling, you know? And after the timing is up, again, I will issue a, 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 another signal by which I can stop uh, collecting this data, you know? Okay. okay. It became uh, a super hit. 
So Orange, Saudi Telecoms, Mobifones, Festel China, all yeah. these codes are running my ideas today on their target courses. Oh, nice. Yeah. And just wanted to show you a small version of it here. Mm -hmm. This is called as an M trace. So you know, M trace is a very simple uh, malloc hook. Uh, I think somewhere I opened it already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how does an M trace work? First, you should see that it's a very simple API, and it has a environmental variable to be declared by you. It means this is the file. Okay. Which, I mean, it can be any file which you want, okay? Mm -hmm. And this file gets created. So I'm using a set environment. There's a environmental variable called as malloc underscore trace. So either you could do it in a command line or you could use it through API also. Okay. So this file will get created and then you can start actually tracing the allocation and freeness in the application. Okay. I'm just trying to explain it here. In this example, and uh, yeah, no, no, come in the while one. So, just to give you one example first. Okay. Yeah. So, now this is a very simple program. In my main, I set the environment saying that this is the file I'm looking where I will be tracing my malloc allocation and deallocation. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And these are the two calls. I'm sleeping for a while. Then I'm freeing a, one of the string. There's a function called as D and that D has a free. So I pass this pointer string here. Me has a string and I free me, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then after that I'm untracing. So I'm stopping the hook. Okay. Well, let's try it. trace this. So I will say GCC M trace dot C. And then I'll say a dot. You know what? The moment, okay, I think I have a file already created here. I have to delete that first to show you this. So RN, my new trace. Let me remove this. Right? Yes. And then we will run this a dot out file. And now you can see the file is created here. Right? Yeah. We'll open up this my new trace log. And now you can notice this. So you have allocated this memory called as 1004. Okay. It is in hex value here, 03EC. 3EC, okay. That's the size of the memory. Mm -hmm. This is another call which you have made, 5 o e which, which is again for string. Mm -hmm. So two mallocs has been performed and you can see plus is a sign for them. Mm -hmm. Minus refers to that there is a free being occupied. So you can see this memory was allocated, this address you can see. Okay. And this was what? Freed. This memory was allocated with these many bytes, but that is not freed yet. Okay. Potential leak. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. Got it. Got yeah, it. yeah, 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 yeah. But if you run this program on production box, it is hard, right? I mean, production box will be tough. So what I did is yeah. uh, watch it here. Uh, it's a while one program which keeps running and allocating memory, mm -hmm. but it doesn't traces unless until I want to enable the trace. So how do I black that? There is a mechanism of signal, so we can register some signals. Okay. For as user defined signal like sig user one, sig user two, mm -hmm. and then register a function which will be called. So, whenever I will raise a notification, sig user one command, mm -hmm. it will call which function? This okay. enable function. Whenever I hit sig user two, it will call a disable function. Okay. And that is written here. Okay. So, the moment it calls enable, what it does? Starts the tracing. And the moment I do not want it, stop the trace. Okay. This goes on a socket. So yeah. from remote also you can send these commands, right? Yeah. 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 So nice. it became a lethal app. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. I mean, I was giving a lecture at uh, Cisco. Okay. 
mm-hmm. in San Jose. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, those guys, the moment they hear it, I love these guys. And you know, on their next edge server, what they have right now, Cisco uh-huh. comes with the fog and edge server. Uh-huh. They have the entire diagnostic available on their power PC boxes. Wow. With the same ideas. Yeah. Very little, you know, developed. Yeah. Very neatly developed. Yeah. I mean, hope, hope you have patented this. I mean, <laughs> it is already there. In the seventh patent. I have roughly mm-hmm. nineteen oh. of mm-hmm. uh, for myself. Oh wow! Mm-hmm. And out of nineteen, uh, yeah. nine of them are my core patents and. Okay, and others with uh, other. Ten is with the companies actually. It's co oh. co company based. Of oh. course, name and all is there. There is none. There. Okay, okay. The I mean, cases and all is there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, wow. but very yeah. nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, very unique things. No, these diagnostics things right. are. And you know, anybody who wants to implement, you know, at least we keep getting some sense, right? Exactly. Yeah. At least. If not sense, at least acknowledgement will also do you know sometimes. Oh, so I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. Thanks. so now you know. Let's try to rebuild this uh, application. And before this, I'm going to delete that. Okay, the file is already deleted. Mm-hmm. So now I run this program, and if you notice. PS, oh sorry, LS, the file is not yet created. Yeah. Because I, I meant interested in accepting that there's a leak going on, you know. Mm-hmm. So this application can run for, you know, maybe a couple of years or one year or six months or two months on the field and I don't disturb them. It's perfectly fine. But imagine if this box got reset for some reason, you know. Yeah. Then why not we have a provision to enable and check that whether it is happening or not. So now what I can do, I can say kill dash. I need a PID for this. So I will have to search the process ID for this. Mm-hmm. So grep A dot out. Now you see this number this is my PID. Yeah. So what I do is here now, uh, kill dash sig user one. So kill command is used to, you know, raise a signal. Mm-hmm. And sig user is one is what is attached to this process ID. So whenever you do this, now what hap- should happen after this? Uh, sorry. The moment I press enter, what should happen? It should enable yeah. the user. So um, imagine the site was suffering. So we said, okay, let's start collecting the diagnostic. Okay. So moment I say this, do you see this log? My new address. Right. Yeah. And maybe say right now I have a lighter window where customer is not interacting with this box from my side. Okay. And my time window is up. I can run a timer based step, right? And start mm-hmm. at this place and script and end up at five star. Put on top jabs, I can put it inside and finish it. Yeah. Yeah. So now after this, I think that okay, I'm done with the diagnostic. Let's stop. So I'll say see user two. Mm-hmm. See, what I'm trying to say is, you can see on the right hand side, application is running as it is it was. Yes. I am not touching it. Yeah. Beautiful, right? You have handles to... Absolutely. It is beautiful thing. Because customer don't experience the shutdown of application at all. Yeah. Yeah. Without shutting down, you have... I have the power to hook myself inside and peep in that what's going on on the right now. Yeah. And now Amazing. I can open up this file. I mean, through socket, I will send it to my, you know, test server guys. They will sit and do this. No. Yeah. 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 I will ask them to, you know, bug. <laughs> find what is the problem? Yeah. Go through the logs. And, uh, yeah. They can go to the logs. We can see a lot of pluses and minus. They can write a script to find this out at home times it's being allocated or free or not. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a very easier way, you know, and a proven and a very lethal way. I mean, it's like 13 years. I haven't heard any problem from these boxes. Wow. So, I mean, I mean, pretty stable concept. Yeah. yeah. Got it, no? Yeah. 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 Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So, now I can maybe, you know, kill the program right? just for demonstration. Yeah. So, this is, this is how, you know, you could uh, really, you know, uh, try to verify and have some provision of testing. 
at least you know if you are not having these uh, uh, applications uh, permission to be this kind of uh, you know sometimes you know we don't want to even tell the clients that we are snooping you right I mean, yeah yeah <laughs> even though we write some snooper codes we don't say them yeah uh, but the whole idea is to collect if something is going wrong the idea is we can provide a better diagnostic and solution right yes yes yeah yeah so I assume that you know worst case if the client does not provide us a option for you know having this kind of uh, availability mm -hmm. because see transparency also with the client is another key right yes, yes. so if it depending on those uh, scenario and we don't have uh, a permission to have this kind of provision on the target go Mm -hmm. A little harder than actually because, yes. see, um, after all, it's their box, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We consider that line also, but at least the similar concept in this case is what we do. We give more stress on the test lab. So anyway, we have a test bed. Yes. And those kind of senior uh, applications, serious applications, can run for six six months mm -hmm. and well testified. We do that anyway, right? For other apps also. Mm -hmm. So let it run for six months and see the regression stuff of this, and then launch it on the you know field. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So before going to field, at least we can do it uh, here a regressive test, right? On the target board, we can launch it and see if it is living. Okay, let's launch one more application. Let's launch. Oh, that guy, that model also is done. Hey, this team, performance team, have you done your application? Please plug that application as well. Okay. Combine all them together and see if still the leak is going on or not, right? Yeah. So from every application, if provisioning is done like this, and if it looks like it is clean for six, seven months, I can remove this uh, tracing stuff and all and uh, check in the code, done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, so these are some possible ways of, you know, uh, trying to diagnose the applications when you write C uh, by using, you know, the leak deductors like electric fence or demaloc by which you can find the errors arriving or you know, using the malloc hooks and M tracing techniques to you know enable the disable or you know uh, have some at this prime of phase you will get that there is a leak going on you know yes. and and none of them fixes the bug by the way right I mean, yeah I mean, uh, diagnosis is all about first knowing that there is a provision to get the data yeah right? yeah this is more harder part I mean you give the problem I think people can solve it right exactly I mean knowing is uh, half done I mean fixing. So, Okay. Exactly. You said it. You said it. Yeah. So, so that's the one. And then you also learn about the code coverage and instrumentation like, you know, GProf and GCall. Yes. Uh, which uh, does this job. You know, so for today, I think we'll keep it here. Okay. okay. And uh, I mean, you know, let's have it tomorrow again around eight o'clock, same time. It's okay for you, right? Sure. Yes. Yes. So we will extend this program for more, you know, debugging and diagnostics also. Okay. Yeah. And I'll also run a small program to show you if we can emulate uh, the booting of uh, ARM hardware on QEMU without using any operating system. So directly a C code by which we can emulate and show you. Okay. So, emulate. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. Really uh, helpful. I mean, yeah. Sure. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. Huh? Yeah. See you tomorrow then. Huh? Good night. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.